Hello, everyone. GM, GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. It is time for your Friday recap, and we have a new guest with us today to break down all things NFTs Web3 with us from this past week. I am joined today by Tang Yan. He is the head of NFT research at Delphi Digital. Back when Delphi had a uh, more like individually priced plan, and I actually had a membership for for Del or a subscription or whatever to, to Delphi. I used to read Tang's like research reports every single week. Probably did that for like a year. So I'm such a fan of Tang's work, and I'm so grateful to have him here with me today. Tang, welcome to the Overpriced JPEGs recap. GM, GM. Hey, Kali. Yes, so excited to be here as well. Like, um, been following the podcast for a long time, and yeah, I think it's just the best way to sort of like catch up with what's going on in the NFT space. Like, you know, even though markets aren't doing so good, there is still a lot that happens, and yeah, excited to be part of this. Dgens continue to degen no matter what. Um, a couple things before we dive into today's episode where we're going to talk, of course, about friend tech because that continues to be the hottest thing, though apparently there is a new friend tech competitor that's interesting that Tang is going to tell us about. We're going to talk about the Machi AIP proposal that passed. We got to talk about Blur, uh, some interesting Blur things that I want to talk about. And then I'm really excited to talk about Momoguru, which there's no particular updates on the project, but there was just a new thread released. People have been speculating that this is a rug. I want to weigh in on that. But before we get into that, I have a couple of announcements and then we need to hear from our sponsors. Uh, the announcements, please stay tuned. So N so if you are an NFT, an OPJ NFT holder, you probably know, hopefully you know by now that we the redemptions are open for your bottles of gin. If you go to the link in the show notes or the link in my Twitter bio, you can go on there and redeem for your bottle of overpriced gin. People have started getting the bottles. They've started posting it on social media. I'm so, so excited seeing these. I cannot wait to hear what you think once you actually try the gin, make a little cocktail. Um, so really, really excited that we are finally at this point. And then another fun announcement for OPJ NFT holders, which is that our final overpriced happy hour event of the year is fast approaching. We now have a date and we have a guest. So we are going to be, the event is going to be in New York on October 11th. And the guest is Raul Pal. Raul Pal, our, our Cayman Islands friend, is going to be here in New York City with me. We are going to be chatting it up. OPJ NFT holders will be able to reserve their, t their seats for that as will uh, Real Vision NFT holders will be able to reserve their seats for that uh, starting this coming Monday, which let me get the date, I believe is September 25th. Uh, yes, Monday, September 25th at 12 p.m. ET. You can go to opjtour.com and reserve your tickets to attend the live event with Raul Pal. So we have uh, a, a couple fun announcements today. I'll, I'll tweet about that as well. Woof! I always try and say them so fast because I know people want to get to the show, but uh, I do have fun making those announcements. Okay, and now we need to hear a word from our amazing sponsors who make this show possible. Y'all know the phrase, not your keys, not your crypto. Well, in a world where too many people have had to learn that the hard way, Overpriced JPEGs is proud to partner with Ledger, the world leader in critical digital asset security. Ledger's Nano S Plus and Nano S hardware wallets, paired with the Ledger Live app, Ledger's own software for setting up your nano device and managing your crypto assets, is the easiest way to start your crypto journey while maintaining full control of your digital assets. You can use all your favorite dApps with Ledger Live, accessing 15 plus Web3 apps, including OneInch, Paraswap, Lido, and Zerion. So you can not only manage, but also grow your portfolio. And Ledger Live is available on mobile and desktop. Securing digital assets shouldn't be complicated. Ledger is as easy as it gets. Uncompromising security, effortless connectivity, full transparency, Ledger is your one-stop shop to trade and track crypto, grow your assets, and manage NFTs. Secure your future with Ledger. Visit shop.ledger.com today or check out the link in the show notes. I am so excited to announce that this year, Overpriced JPEGs has partnered with OpenSea, the world's leading NFT marketplace built for everyone, creators, collectors, noobs, and experts alike. I'm an OpenSea user because they have the best selection of NFTs and a truly inclusive view of the ecosystem, supporting eight chains and eight global languages. I trust the systems they've put in place to keep the space safe, like copy mint protection, malicious URL detection and removal, robust verification, and more. It's why they are the place to buy, sell, and create NFTs. That's right. You know OpenSea, you use OpenSea, but did you know that OpenSea now has drops? 
New exclusive projects launch every week from top projects and creators, and you can check them out now using the link in the show notes. They also recently introduced self-serve drops, which is in beta, and allows creators to launch their projects right on OpenSea. This drops product gives creators access to tools like rich storytelling drop pages, multi-chain support, and drop mechanic customization. The full launch for self-serve drops is coming this spring. So check out the upcoming drops on OpenSea right now using the link in the show notes and own what moves you. You'll also be supporting the show in the process. All right, Tang, let's start this podcast the way I always start podcasts, which is like general vibe check, uh, NFT volume down, down, down. ETH NFT volume is just some of the lowest it's ever been. Friend tech continues to be not up. It's down since the airdrop happened, since the Friday airdrop happened, but like steady. People are still operating on friend tech. Crypto kind of stagnant. How are you feeling? What are your vibes? Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. I feel like um, we are probably in a pretty deep sort of like bear market for NFTs. And I kind of know this because like, you know, normally I would check like um, prices on of NFTs on Blur like um, every day. But actually like this week, like I barely like even touch um, Blur itself because like there isn't really anything interesting that's going on in the space and I can, can kind of understand like why volume volumes are so low so um yeah pretty much everyone's attention has shifted to like um this like social five friend tech kind of like mela and it even though they aren't nfts they also behave a little bit like nfts i was telling some of my friends that um friend tech is almost like um giving you a first-hand experience of how to actually run a pfp collection because you have to generate yeah. all this hype interest attention get people to buy you get people not to sell your keys and stuff um yeah so i think it's a pretty <laughs> interesting dynamic right now yeah it's turning all of us into to the pfp creators we never intended to be um <laughs> marfa is happening this week on a vibes a vibes moment i suppose which is uh it's the Art Blocks conference hosted by by Eric Calderon, you know, Snowfro in Marfa, Texas. Um, there was a fun little Chromie Squiggle update today or, you know, update this week. I think the video has been deleted, but a YouTube video went up followed by a, a, some tweets about how somebody was sort of questioning the math on, was it like the, the like this Chromie Squiggle's trait data essentially, but also like the perfect, you know, there's like those perfect spectrum chromies and i think the I, I think those were being um being questioned anyways eric responded very diplomatically as he always does just being like i'm i love all of the attention that and the interaction and the engagement that chromie squiggles have generated through the years i mean that's really the point of art in general and uh and snowfro just saying that this is like this investigation now goes down as part of chromie squiggles story and lore and uh i think it's really fun i mean it, it does for anybody questioning whether or not generative art is art, I think these kinds of engagements like prove it is because this is what you do with art. You analyze it and investigate it and debate about it. And is is Jackson Pollock really art and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, so I thought that was fun. Um, you mentioned Blur. We also had a, a new unlock, a distribution unlock for you know, the, for Blur insiders and investors and, and early participants, I think it was about $8.3 million in Blur token were unlocked there. Talk to me. I know, I think Delphi actually just put out sort of a state of the nation or a report on Blur. Talk to me a little bit about the findings there and, and where you stand on Blur right now. Yeah, sure, Kari. I think, um, you know, Blur is something that has been very interesting because it just gets so much hate from everybody um especially on crypto twitter like well it gets love too from some people people some people love oh well okay yeah maybe a bit <laughs> just a little bit maybe tiny bit of love but um yeah um everyone kind of blames it for like why the nft markets are, are are doing so bad why token prices are down but i think like if we think if we sort of like zoom out a little bit like i think we kind of like know that at some point in the future like nfts the NFT market is going to bounce back again because the NFTs are just so fun um, to speculate and trade. Um, and when that sort of like happens, right, I think NFT marketplaces are going to be sort of like the fastest horse to sort of like bet on. Everyone's going to be jumping on these because they're just such good businesses. Once they have like, once they are starting to charge fees, they'll be generating a lot of um, fees. And I think with Blur, um, 
there is something that's probably going to happen pretty soon. Like just yesterday, um, Pac-Man just tweeted out that um, even though they have been pretty much silent for the last um, couple of weeks, um, they're actually making very good progress and you know, basically just an announcement of an announcement, like teasing that something is going to come up um, pretty soon, but with no exact date. And you speculated some things you think that might be coming down the pike that the that, that Pac-Man's tweet may be alluding to. What do you think it could be? Yeah. So... I, they, they said that there are probably going to be like three major developments that they haven't revealed yet for Blur. So while doing our research, we were sort of like speculating a little bit on what some of these like new products or business lines uh, for Blur could be. Because today Blur has a very, has a marketplace that's doing a lot of volume today. They have probably the top NFT lending product as well, which is Blend. And so they've captured like these two verticals like pretty well. Um, so we speculate like what else could they be sort of like building or having up their sleeve in line with their vision to sort of like become the Binance of like NFTs. Um, so a few things I think that come to mind, I think the most top of mind is going to be sort of like NFT perps that allows people to sort of like trade NFTs without actually having to own or buy the actual physical, I guess not physical, the actual entire sort of like NFT. Um, I think that's interesting because we know that like um, these derivative markets generally have much larger volumes than spot markets if you just look at what's going on in the rest of the token world and even the traditional finance world. So I think that's definitely one. So I NFT derivatives, like sort of like yes. like a synthetic NFTs, basically. Exactly. So like, for example, like oh if you don't God. have like 40 ETH to sort of like buy a crypto punk today, but you still want to capture the upside of the crypto punks, you can just buy let's say one ETH worth of it and, and still and still be able to sort of ride it up uh, if you think it's going to go up um so yeah that's that's the derivative so fraction wait so fractional buying of nfts as opposed so not not necessarily like synthetic like fully synthetic but like like you can buy a fraction of it and just track the the price movement in that sense yeah but you don't actually buy a fractional version of it is it's essentially like right, a fractional right, version, okay. but it's not fractional in that sense. It's I just a, a, yes. a synthetic. It's just a market product. tracker. It just tracks Correct. the price. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Exactly. I'm fully with you. Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and I think like also like I was talking to some people, I think we speculating maybe they might launch some kind of like product that allows people to hitch or short against their NFTs. Because I think like in the NFT market today, I think there's a very big demand for being able to like short NFTs and sort of like, um, especially when things, when prices go up too much and you feel that they are likely overhyped or, or has gone up too much, you need to have a way to make the market more efficient and allow um, people mm -hmm. to sort of like um, take that kind of trade as well. So I think they might be thinking about something like this. Any other more traditional products would be some kind of NFT launch pad. It could be some kind of like NFT sort of like trading board that sort of like makes it easier for people to trade NFTs using Telegram the same way like Unibot has sort of like um, done it for tokens. And maybe even sort of like an NFT index fund that allows people to sort of like invest um, in a basket of mm -hmm. like NFTs along say either Maybe it could be generative art, it could be gaming, and all of that stuff. So I feel like, I mean, there's no yeah. information, we have no insight info, but um, I think they're probably thinking around some of these different things right now. Yeah, yeah, that's it's, it's really interesting. I mean, th those are all good guesses. We obviously won't know for sure until mm -hmm. until we get the announcement out. I'm more cynical on Blur than it sounds like you are. I mean, you know, I, I, you were saying... I, I, you were, I think, sort of alluding to the idea that you maybe think Blur tokens are a good buy right now. Obviously, please, please, very seriously, not financial advice. Nobody go out and buy Blur tokens on, on the basis of this. But sort of reading between the lines, you, that's what you were saying. Like, hey, eventually the NFT market will come back and and owning the, the token of a marketplace is maybe an interesting bet in that universe. And, and Blur will be an interesting marketplace in a universe where, where NFT the NFT market does come back. I think my cynicism, well, A, I have concerns about the Blur token being a security, and that's a longer rabbit hole to, to go down. But if the NFT market did come like roaring back and Blur was a big marketplace, I could see the SEC certainly going after it uh, potentially and, and going after the Blur token specifically. Um, but second, you know, what do you make of this speculation that they're continuing to drag out the Blur airdrop? You know, perhaps they're trying to ensure that insiders are getting paid out before the next Blur airdrop happens, and and the token potentially like crashes further in price. Like, do you, do you buy any of that? Like, are you cynical on that front? So I'll just add and and say that I don't 
think that um, like I I personally probably wouldn't be buying Blur tokens right now just because okay. there's a very big overhang of exactly what you described by right? season two 300 million tokens are going to be unlocked in some way we don't know exactly when that's going to be um, but I do think at some point in time you know maybe in the near future especially when that season two unlock sort of happens and people sell I think that could be a very interesting time to watch and and sort of like potentially sort of accumulate this for for the long term. And I think you're absolutely right. I think the challenge we've seen with Blur is that there is a very high inflation rate. Like from the launch of the token within the first year, I think the the supply of the token is going to go up like three x. Right, and that's why like, all these investors are basically slowly unlocking their tokens. The the team itself is also unlocking their tokens. So I think there is going to be more of that sell pressure to come. And I think with season two, yeah, honestly, the incentives for the Blur team are to drag it out as long as possible, right? Because as long as they keep dragging, people are still hopeful, people are still going to continue to farm these airdrops and there isn't that sort of like token selling that or that large supply that just suddenly comes to the market. But eventually at some point in time, they will probably have to sort of like end it. Um, my best guess is that it's probably going to happen sooner rather than later. But mm. what they will probably do is that they will, if I were them at least, right? I think they would pair the announcement with something very positive to sort of like, um, for example, they could be announcing something new, a new product, or they could be announcing some kind of like new mechanism for maybe staking their tokens that will sort of like reduce some of the sell pressure around the token when the unlock comes. So if I were them, like I wouldn't mm-hmm. just announce the end of season two, but I'll make sure that it's time right. with something that's very positive it's as paired. well. That, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, look, the, the, the whole thing we've talked, I've talked about this on the show a lot, I, and I don't have a problem the way others do with like, oh, they've ruined the NFT market because they've made it all about financialization. Mm-hmm. Like, that was inevitable. That That's what this market was. They just put it in stark terms. And, you know, I, I don't even, I don't have a problem per se with the incentives, the airdropping incentives, the, the, the token farming incentives, though I do want to be very eyes wide open about how that's manipulated the, the market. And I, I, I want to be aware of how that's completely distorted the market. Like when we're talking about, oh, you know, some sort of shorting mechanism would make the market more efficient and but also like airdrop farming totally distorts the reality, like these clearing prices anyway. So who, who, who you know, Blur's done a bunch of stuff that, that kind of manipulates the market. And But it, it feels kind of like, an, it, it is what it is to me on that side. But I do, I do worry about its future from the standpoint of, you know, the, the argument for the Blur token is that at some point they'll turn on a marketplace fee and distribute those, profits to the token holder i mean that's what we're all expecting Mm. i don't know that they've uh, formally said that i think they've alluded to that and i just know when that day comes like they need to keep dragging this out because they basically need the nft market to really be back in order for that promise to mean anything i guess um so that is something that concerns me about blur yeah no 100 percent. i think like right now today if you look at the blur token itself it's it's pretty much a useless token right there isn't very much yeah. I mean, there isn't actually anything you can do with it. It's supposed to be governance, but there isn't really much governance that's actually happening right now on the platform. Happening. And I think, like, I've heard, like, um, Pam and talk on a couple of, like, podcasts, and I think they're likely going to, like, turning on fees for them doesn't sound like an immediate priority. I feel like they want to grow first before sort of, like, turning on the yes. fees. And I kind of, like, agree with that as well, because you have to time it well with the market. If you turn the fees on in a bear market... I think people are just going to stop trading, like volumes will drop yes. even more. But if it's, yes. if when the market's in a much better state, people don't mind paying like say a 0.5% or 1% fee because things like prices are going up and they can make even more from that. So I think it's a little bit about timing as well, but uh, well, who knows what. It's it, it, 100% about timing. Mm. And that I think that's sort of my point is like, the NFT market has to come back or they have to like, mm. and I know they're looking to expand probably beyond just NFT markets and, and maybe get into like DeFi markets and other markets as well, who knows. But, but point being like, Totally. Like they have to wait. They have to have these markets come back before they do any of this because if they turned a fee on. Yeah, we, I don't need to hash what you just said. I, I think that's I think that's exactly right. Um, well, speaking of Blur, we've got Blur's biggest airdrop farmer, Maki Big Brother, who uh, proposed was it? E- it was AIP 304. Basically, the proposal was to use 11 million in Ape to purchase Apes 
mutants, punks to get them into museums. I think that got expanded into kind of buying digital art in general, but I think the emphasis was on, you know, maybe secretly also kind of boosting the price of <laughs> mutants, uh, apes, and 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 punks. Um, and it has passed. The proposal has passed. It was leaning past for a long time. You know, Maki waited to vote until the very end, and um, he has he has a lot of voting tokens. So, what do you think? Like, what did you are do you have apes? Like, did you vote in this? Did, would you support this proposal? Do you support this proposal? No, um, I mean, I I wasn't, but I don't. I, yeah, I don't have any ape coins, so I wasn't um, participating in this. Um, but as I was going through this, like um, the last couple of days, I was I actually thought it was pretty amusing, like just seeing um what they were trying to do um and it's basically about like trying to bring the apes like into the museums and having them presented as like you know very you know, as fine art or or cultural pieces which i thought was like very different from like what the bought apes um are kind of like meant to do i feel like it's not the kind of thing that sort of like fits very well into a museum but you know if ul labs can create a very good game they can create a good metaverse and you can actually use your apes in this game or metaverse they're creating i think that's perfect but i kind of like i find it very hard to see like people stopping by in some of these like top museums in the world and then staring and looking at a picture of these um bought apes because they just don't fit the kind of like vibe um, around that and I feel like that's also kind of a, this probably highlights a little bit of the issue with, I think around like DAO governance today as well I was looking at the sort of like voting and seems like uh, you know Maki was the probably the biggest voter like, I think like he had like 4 million votes and he sort of like voted mm -hmm. for his um, his own proposal and the voter turnout was I mean I think it was not particularly high um, so it's very easy for like big um, whales to sort of influence the direction of this vote one way or the other. Um, yeah, I mean, well, it's passed, so it's going to happen. Um, and, and we'll see what it, it does. I'm confused because I've heard both. I know the, the main focus is on apes and mutants and I guess punks. Mm. But I also thought I heard like they were maybe going to try and get other NFTs into museums as well. Is that what you would heard? Like it's not just about apes and mutants, though that's the primary focus. Is that your sense of it? Yeah, so I think they, they kept it open. They said that um, there's like yes, okay. an others component. So it's not limited to just the apes and the punks as well. Um, I think it's going to be sort of like decided by a committee they've sort of like formed um, around Correct. this to sort yeah, of like choose which NFTs to do yes. it. Um, but I think the general word on the ground is that people do feel that, you know, because like these um, Machi and the, and the rest of the team, they are very big like ape holders as well. So this is kind of a way to sort of like also support the floor prices of um, the NFTs itself using the our treasury. Totally. Like that's what I was going to say. And I haven't seen all the, the chatter around it, but like it, it, this feels very clearly it's Maki that we're talking about here, right? Like, do, yeah. like I don't get the sense that, I, I don't know, maybe he's a big museum fine art lover, but <laughs> I think he even specifically said that he wants to stop spending his own money, like buying up all these apes. Like he's sick of having to spend yeah. his own money on all this stuff. And so it feels like basically Maki has been the the person propping up, well, Fra we had Franklin for a while there, I guess, but but he, he sort of stopped, like propping up ape prices for the last, for, for a long time. And... He's sort of like, mm, kind of sick of having to use my own money for this. So why don't we use some ApeCoin money for this now? But I can't just say, hey, let's use ApeCoin to prop up the prices of apes because I'm sick of doing it. So instead, I'm going to put this spin of trying to get it in the museums. It is very hard for me to imagine that any museums are going to take apes. Frankly, it feels like if the museums wanted apes, they would already have them. But I, I understand that sometimes you need to actually pitch in order to make something happen. So yeah, I, I see this as very much a... Uh, a, I don't want to call it a vanity project because it, it does actually benefit the the entire community, uh, you know, more than it doesn't just benefit Maki. But um, yeah, it feels like this is a, a, a smokescreen for like the underlying motivation. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way as you as well. Like as I was looking through the proposal as well, they, it was pretty light on details on how they will actually execute on this. Um, how they actually bring it out to the museums and stuff. So it does feel very much like... Um, Hey, you know, let's just take some money from the treasury. Let's just buy up these NFTs. And, you know, I guess at least the ecosystem people who own the apes will kind of like benefit from this. So they are pretty supportive of this um, overall as well. Let me introduce you to a brand new company that I could not be more excited about. Web3Sense. 
a Web3 analytics platform that combines on-chain data with social media insights to give you the deepest, most meaningful intelligence into any NFT community. I have tested other analytics platforms out there, but Web3Sense has the most comprehensive capabilities I've seen in the NFT ecosystem. They apply sophisticated data science to wallet histories to determine behavioral patterns and help shape predictive analytics. In other words, they can tell you which Twitter accounts are actually the influencers in your space. And they can tell you what resonates most within a community by looking at what other communities token holders are involved in. The number of use cases here is virtually unlimited. So whether you're a trader, creator, institution, brand, agency, I promise Web3Sense has data that you want to see with the deep and actionable insights that you need to build, analyze, grow, start, whatever you want to do within the NFT space and in terms of building a business and a community. Now, they are still in very early days, so they're eager to connect with the community. So if you're interested in learning more about what Web3Sense can do for you and your business, and you should be, go and fill out the very short form linked to in the show notes, and someone from their team will reach out with more information and an opportunity for a product demo. Trust me, you won't regret it. Well, moving on to, let's talk a little friend tech, and then I, I want to close with, with some of the Momoguru news. So friend tech, I've talked about it for the last several weeks on the podcast, so I don't know that we have to go you know, uh, too deep into it, though I would be curious your thoughts on it. But I did want to talk out talk about here just at the top some of the fees paid out by friend tech because I, I do think this is interesting. So this comes from a post by Web3 Academy where they outline, you know, they they give the different percentages of of what you know friend tech pays and you know takes and pays out. Friend tech itself takes five percent, five percent gets paid, paid out to creators, and then there's fees that they owe to base for being you know for executing trades, and then of course base pays a fee to the Ethereum network in general for settlement. So. Frentech has made the company, you know, the 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 app Frentech has made seven point four million dollars since inception. I suppose seven point four million dollars has been paid out to creators, which is really amazing. Um, build on base revenue, they've made seven hundred thirty six thousand dollars top line from this, and then Ethereum holders and stakers have made two hundred fifty four thousand dollars from this, and then Optimism, who also has a, a take in this, makes seventy two thousand dollars. Optimism and Ethereum it get paid out by base. So base's net profit is four hundred eighty-two thousand, about half a million dollars, um, which is really it is really cool to see. Like it, you know, to to realize this broader ecosystem that we're a part of and that activity, all activity. I mean, we know this, but like all on-chain activity ultimately accrues to Ethereum stakers. If you're talking about being on Ethereum, and, or you know, value accrues to, to all these different players. And I think, um, you know. I don't think friend tech is an app that's going to be able to sustain itself forevermore, but it's, it was just a cool look to me to see, oh yeah, this is how this is enriching an entire ecosystem. And, um, and I really, I really liked that. It, it made me a little happy during these times when there's, there's so much that's sort of dead or, or dying. Yeah. hundred percent. Like, like honestly, right. I, have, I mean, as a friend tech user myself, I, I feel like I was honestly a little bit skeptical about this like initially, right? Like it seemed like a pretty lousy app. The interface was very clunky, but I found myself sort of like just using it more and more just because like I feel like lately the last maybe two to four weeks, like a lot of the conversations that were have it, that were happening on Twitter has kind of like shifted over um, to friend tech. At least some of the influencers mm -hmm. who have been sort of like signed up on, on that. And I think just seeing like people, like creators just being able to earn some fees from this um, is really cool, exactly what you said, because typically on all these like social media platforms like Twitter or X, like, it's really hard. Like you can create lots of content, you can get lots of followers, but how do you actually make a living out of this? You either have to do some other kind of, um, um, you know, sell some kind of like paid membership or paid program in order to sort of like monetize and that. And it's not easy, right? It's not, it's not easy for creators to sort of like do that, especially those who are not so um, business minded. So I think Frentech has sort of like kicked this off. Um, but very much like what is happening today is still very much a lot of speculation. Like a lot of people are just trying to figure out which are the keys to buy that will likely pump and go up in price so that they can sell it a little bit later on. Um, a lot of people are trying to find the, the best points, ways. incentivization. Exactly. Yeah, just find, trying to find the best way to earn the most points so that they can get this airdrop, which hopefully will be worth some money, like, you know, in about five months um, time or so. Uh, but I think what it does is that it gives Frentech a little bit of a breathing space. So it has probably the next couple of months to sort of figure out how do you make this app even more interesting and also give creators on the app that opportunity to find 
ways to add value to the people who sort of like own their keys. Um, I think right now it's quite primitive. A lot of people are doing things like you know, raffles, like Ding Ling has been doing like NFT raffles in his room um, every day. And, and that was really cool because I actually, I actually won <laughs> one of his raffles like just a few days ago. He was giving out these like six Azuki Oh my gosh. Island. Yeah, he was giving out these six Azuki oh Elementals and he just raffled it off and said, hey, you won. And he messaged me on Twitter and I thought, oh, that was very cool. I never expected that uh, to happen to me in like 2023, getting an NFT from Ding Ling. <laughs> but I, think, I guess Frantic is just awesome. enabling some of these like new interactions that are out there. Um, but it definitely has challenges. I think it a lot. One issue that's happening in Frantic right now is that um, a lot of people are just buying up their own keys um, in order to sort of like farm. Yes, this yeah, they got happening. the same kind of air, the, the farming or the like. It's like you know, the, it feels like a wash trading. It's the equivalent of like wash trading to like make their total value locked in the platform that much higher to to get more points. But they're really just buying up their own keys. It's it's yeah. it's interesting. I think people figure out that it's much less risk to buy your own keys rather than buy other people's keys because you can kind of like just control the price and just sit there and just keep farming the airdrop. Whereas if you buy somebody else's keys, it might just drop or he might just decide to stop using friend tag and then you lose your your eve there. So that's why I think people sort of like figure out this game. And I think the team needs to find some way to solve this problem. Otherwise, I think it's gonna be an existential issue for friend tag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you actually mentioned to me before we started recording that there's a, a, a I don't want to say a friend tech knockoff because it sounds like it's a little bit different, but another platform that sprung up that some people are are migrating to from friend tech that you've played around with a little bit. Tell us about that. Yeah, this was actually pretty exciting. Like it kind of just got a little bit of traction like earlier um, today um, because a lot of people were talking about it. But is this like new app that's called Post Tech? So P O S T T E C H. So it's it's launched on Arbitrum, um, and it has very similar dynamics to Frantech, where basically you can buy other people's shares and you can earn a sort of like um, transaction fee um, from that. But I think a few things are a little bit more unique to that. If you log into Postech, you'll see that it looks very much like a Twitter interface. It looks exactly the same. And I think some of the conversations are not just limited to you and the individual holders, but it almost becomes a little bit more like a group chat where other people can also, other people can see the messages that other people in the room also talk about. Um, so we've been seeing like a lot of people like sort of like jump ship uh, from friend tag, people sell off their keys and decide to jump on the post tag um, ship right now. If you look at the total value lock on post tag, I think it's about 1 million the last I checked, but it's been just upwards over the last 24 hours or so. And I think people are just trying to catch and ride this wave of rising interest in this. Um, I'm personally a little bit skeptical because I, I tried it a little bit myself, but is very buggy. Like um, you just get stuck um, clicking on some of the things. It doesn't work. You get an error page quite often. Um, so I'm not sure if the team, no one really knows who these people are. I think they've said that they've gotten a grant from Arbitrum Foundation, but otherwise we don't really have any like information on, on them. So everyone's just playing around with this right now. Is it buggier than Frontech was in the beginning? Oh, I think so. I think it, it's... Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of times you just get these error pages. That's saying something. It's like Frentech also is still a little bit funky, but was like, you it's know, true. has gotten better. But like, you know, when I first joined, it definitely was not, not the easiest. Is it the same process where you basically download the like browser page directly to your home screen on your on your smartphone as opposed to... Obviously, you're not going to go through the app store on this. Is it the same like general setup process as, as Frentech? Yeah, very similar. So actually, it's... I think it's right now it's mostly you, you can just assess it through your on your computer through the web browser so you don't need to download anything you just go to the website mm. and then basically you just lock so it is in more like twitter your, like that got it got yeah it. exactly you just lock in with your twitter account um you still need some invite codes right now they follow the same playbook as friend tech but um yeah i think people are just like sharing these um, things right now yeah, it always makes me nervous when it's like an anonymous team. Mm. Like I always, I never want to be the 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 literal first person on those things because like you just never know, like you know what 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 shenanigans could be happening. But you know, you're right. I mean, you said this earlier. It's it's this SoFi meta that we're in right now that is in some ways to me much more interesting than the than any of the like the PFP metas we've had. 
um, because there is sort of a core something to them in a way that didn't really feel like it was the case with some of the PFP metas during like the height of the bull. But, but they still feel just as unsustainable because people are doing them really fundamentally to to make money and and specifically i think the creators are participating because they can make money and and this is where you know we love i love seeing creators getting paid out in a way that you pointed out like in a way that they can't be even on something like an x that is starting to pay creators but it's just so much easier to make money on on these platforms now but that's because people are really in there to speculate and, and are really in there to to points farm and things and so it's it's sort of artificial so uh, but I, but I'm enjoying this. I, I actually I really like the SoFi Meta as a as an intellectual case study more than I enjoyed, in some ways even just the PFP Meta uh, is the truth. So I think it, I think it's it's pretty interesting. We will continue to track the front tech story. Lots of hot takes. I mean I don't know. Did you have a favorite take you've seen on on Twitter on on front tech? You had Blau who quit it, saying that he felt like the risks weren't worth it, and that he's donating the eight ETH that he made on the platform to a music charity. Um, people were, were shitting on him because they were saying he should have given the money back to his holders or to his key holders. But first of all, I mean, that sounds like a complicated process to, to sort of enable in some ways, like having to figure out everybody's wallets. And, and I don't know. He made the money. We all know the risks. Like at some point, I think everybody's going to rug on front tech because I, I don't know that it'll really be sustainable. I don't, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think that's the biggest problem with Frantech right now is that there's no way for someone to sort of like exit in a very clean way because, you know, if you decide that you don't want to use Frantech anymore, you don't want to create content or you don't want to stay engaged, like the only way is you just, um, you, you can sell your keys or you can just tell people that you're not creating and people will just slowly sell off. But there's no way, for, I mean, and, and when people sell off, whoever sells the last is going to sort of like get the shortest end of the stick, right? So um, yeah, there's, there's just, I can understand why like people who have that very strong reputation like Blau and all that are very cautious about getting this. And I feel like it's something that the team would need to either fix in terms of like, either some kind of like new customization features that allow creators to set the kind of like curves or fees that they want. Um, and stuff but uh yeah it feels like that's there's something that is broken about that right now and i wonder what will happen if yeah. say a lot of people stop creating content or stop being active on fan tech like what would really happen to all these prices of the keys well speaking of rugs i'm going to transition us here which is to mama guru and people might be saying why are we talking about mama guru it feels like this story played out a couple months ago even, but there was a, a an updated thread by Loki the Bird who had been who's been tweeting about Momoguru for, for months now. And basically there's this I think rising narrative that Momoguru is a rug. And I don't agree with this in some ways at all. And but I wanted to talk about it. So I know you've been sort of loosely tracking the story, but I don't know that you've been like deep in it. Should I give some context here for you and for some of the listeners as to like what the backstory on this is? Yeah, that would be amazing. Like, um, yeah, and I can share some thoughts on that after as well, but you'd love to hear, hear that. Okay, great. So Momoguru launched, I believe it was in March of 2023. You may even know this because I know you follow this stuff really closely. Yeah, Does that sound right? Yeah. March of this year? That's right. Yeah. And so we're talking about really in the height of a lot of blur airdrop farming that was going on. Because season two had the season one airdrop had happened in January. Yeah, I think it was February. When did season one airdrop happened. happen? February? February. Yeah, so it's just around yep. that time. Okay, so like a month po, we're like a you know, and it was like March second that that Mama Guru launched. So it launches in the in the in the height of like airdrop farming, and so there's so much liquidity and activity happening, and they were a pretty hyped project even leading up to it. And then they were super hyped in the immediate aftermath because Momoguru is an IP play with a gaming component um, by a team called Baobao, Baobab, which is a studio that has done some really critically acclaimed, like kind of highly acclaimed, like short film work. They've worked with people like Oprah and I think Kate Winslet have done voiceover work for some of their projects. So they're in this very, I would say like high, highbrow, beautiful, like animation creation world. And they have backing from Disney and even some former like senior Disney people make up the executive team of Baobab. Baobao, Baobao, I believe it is. And so, you know, you already have liquidity, you have activity, you have trading, you have people sort of uh, this little 
moment of excitement around NFTs again within the heart of the bear, getting super, super hyped up about this Momoguru project. And the project takes off. There's a there's a ton of activity around it. And then as happens with all things, like people started to be disappointed by the deliveries. And I want to talk about that. And then there's just FUD. And then this is where Blur just like, Blur is just puts on steroids, whatever the sentiment is, right? If people are excited about something, the Blur incentives mean it'll just drive it higher and higher. And as soon as sentiment turns, Blur means that it just drives things lower and lower and lower. And so that's basically what happened to Momoguru, which was it had this like sort of meteoric rise and people were super excited and then it wasn't everything that people wanted and then the FUD just came crashing down. So Loki the bird in, let's see, when was it? It was in July of this year, I want to say. In July of this year, writes this like investigative thread on Momo Guru to say like what happened and basically is this a rug and and what it amounts to is is essentially there were you know a handful of things that that Momo Guru had promised I mean they had these sort of vague abstract promises of just like we're going to build this amazing IP because of who we are as a team and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then sort of concretely within that there were three then specific deliverables which is they said they were going to have a um an RPG game and sort of like a metaverse activation game thing, and then a TV show. And the metaverse activation game was specifically Roblox. And then they were going to do a TV show. And the the top line here for me, and I'll, I'll get into some of the nuance, but they've delivered on two of the three things here within the first year of launching. They did launch an RPG. Now, there's a lot of controversy over was this really a game how fun was this the game felt really lame to a lot of people and I'll get into some of those criticisms but they did they fully launched one and I think it actually took a lot more work and money than than people realize second they did launch an activation in Roblox that's still active now it's it's sort of in be- it's I think it's in beta of some sort but it's like you can go and you can play it and it exists and then the TV show which has not happened yet but it's also like it's September, they launched this in March. TV shows don't happen that quickly. And also, by the way, nobody cares about NFTs. And I'm sure they're facing a lot of like, I'm sure it's a it's an uphill battle to, to be building sort of any sort of NFT IP show. So just at the highest level, I think it's really hard to call this a rug when the team has delivered like two out of the three things that were specifically promised. And I, I just, I really take issue with this idea that we call something a rug simply because our expectations were really high or the team even said our expectations in an abstract sense high and then didn't deliver on those abstract expectations. Like, I just think it's way too low of a bar for what for what constitutes a rug. Now, with that said, I think there's a lot of things that can be criticized. I think the Baobab team has not handled this well in a lot of ways, and I want to get into that. But I just want to pause there at the outset. Any questions about our setup here, Tang? You know, how much have you been kind of following this? How do you feel about the whole, like, we call something a rug because our number didn't go up phenomenon? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I was following Momoguru um, quite a bit like, before it launched and before it had its mint. And I think it was, I was really excited for, about it because it sort of like fit into this thesis that um, I had that, you know, we're going to see a lot more of these like creators from the Web2 space sort of like come into the NFT space and start to create stuff and do really interesting sort of like, IP plays in that sector. And I think it's also in a time where I think NFT prices were also trending down and we were sort of like clinging on to hope that, you know, we have some like new interesting projects that will sort of like save the market around there. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the biggest, to me, I felt that um, probably there was some level of like um, over-representation either in terms of like Mm -hmm. what their previous like backgrounds were or what their previous achievements. And I think that is a chronic disease or a chronic issue, like I think in the web yes. space, especially with like um, what I've seen is like with games, like there are a lot of like web three games that are being developed right now. And a lot of them like um, promise a lot of very cool stuff and they release um, very interesting stuff like trailer. But when you actually go and play the game itself, you, you actually get disappointed because like um, it's just very difficult to actually create a very good game. It just takes a lot of time, effort, money, development, um, interest to sort of like do that. And I think what I'm starting to realize is that like for me, I've sort of like set the bar that like if it's going if it's a web3 game i do i want to see a gameplay trailer i want to see how the game actually 
place out and not just a sort of like an introduction or cinematic kind of like trailer uh, around that. So I, I feel like, I don't know. I, I feel like if I were a Momo Guru holder, I will be a little bit disappointed with what they've sort of like produced yes. um, so far. So I think you're exactly right. I think I think you're exactly right that this, there felt like there were over-representations made. And this is, you call it a chronic disease of this space, which is, I think, of course, spot on. And, and perhaps even especially true when you have outside players like a Bao Bao studio that's not totally Web3 native, who doesn't entirely understand how this space works, come in and, I mean, what are they supposed to do? They're not lying about who Baobab is, but it it does then, cr- it allows for imaginations to run wild. Mm. And this is a space where imaginations already are, are going to run wild or fill in blanks with, with hype and excitement and expectation. And so you have to, you have to be much more realistic. Now, I, I'm interested in that you said this gameplay trailer piece specifically because this is one of the the big points of contention and something that Loki brings up here. And there's actually some um, some clarification I want to give to this. So, so I said there were like three kind of concrete promises amidst a backdrop of kind of like abstract hype, right? Like I, I think the, the again, kind of abstractly painting themselves as this really accomplished studio that's getting into this space and going to do all these cool things. And that was sort of this abstract layer where there wasn't anything specific promised, but that was sort of the the impression and the sense and the picture that had been painted. And then there were these sort of three more specific things that were were promised. And it was the the game, the Roblox metaverse activation, and then the, and then the TV show. So clearly a huge error on the part of the Baobao team was not releasing a gameplay trailer for this RPG. I think what people were picturing was something of like a World of Warcraft, right? Like they were picturing like a really like amazing kind of big expansive world and game and something that's awesome and super fun to play. And and the team had um the team had had bragged about their game design team right as as having worked on magic the gathering and pokemon and these other other big games not that they're like world of warcraft per se but like you know in that in that vein and they never released a gameplay trailer which again just allowed imaginations to go crazy and as loki points out the team had been saying that the game was in beta and the game was ready for like three months before they finally put the game out but they never released a gameplay trailer. So it, it felt like it allowed expectations to continue to be whatever people were picturing without ever really like concretely concretely saying like, here's what the game is by releasing a trailer. And so when the game actually finally did release, it just felt very, I think like very click and wait. It, it was text-based. It was, it was quite simple relative to what people were expecting. Now, I want to clarify something because one of the things that Loki brings up here is they bragged about having this game design team that had worked on all of these, you know, amazing projects and they put their headshots up and their bios up and whatever. But then the team, the game was actually made by Little Massive and the Momo Guru team only spent 5% of the mint on making this game. And like, this is proof that they didn't put any energy into this game. And that's like further proof that this whole thing is a rug. Well, here's the reality. The game design team was the five people that people saw on the website that had the experience with within um uh what was that? what are the ga- game the magic the gathering and pokemon like that was the team that designed the gameplay mechanics how was it going to how was it going to play how was it going to feel how did it work what were the rules like they designed the entire game that was that team that they were bragging about and then they had a, a and then they contracted out to little massive to actually just build the interface do the coding to make the game work the way that it had been spec'd. So Little Massive was just a contracted, a team that was just contracted to to build the interface, build the whatever, but the game had actually been designed by the five people they were bragging about. So I, I do think there's a distinction there that Loki understandably is confused about is like, why is the team to- the team that made this game is actually totally different than the team they said was going to make this game? Like painting a picture that is like basically Bao Bao got into the space made 2000 ETH on this mint, promised a bunch of stuff, and then contracted out to a bunch of losers to actually do all the work. So they could just say they did something, but they actually just kept a lot of money for themselves. I feel like that's the picture he's kind of trying to paint, something almost like a pixel mon. And, and I just think the reality is actually a lot more nuanced and complicated here. Um, you know, I, I've, I've talked to a, a variety of different people and like they did, so the, and that 100 ETH that they were like, oh, they only spent 100 ETH, they only spent 5%. To make this game, no, that that hundred ETH went to Little Massive, who were designed to 
who just like built out the game, but they paid who knows how much more on the game design team who designed the original game, who spent, you know, like six months, a year, whatever, designing that game. They then had a separate team who were the animators who made all the assets for that, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know how much they spent. I'm not trying to like, I know I sound like I'm full-throatedly defending Baobao, which I, I, I'm not intending to do because I think they made a lot of mistakes. They should have released the gameplay trailer. Um, but I'm trying to point out that there was like m a lot more being done here than I think people realize. And I just think there's this perpetual unrealistic expectation problem in this space of people not knowing. It's like, it feels like, holders like don't know how the real world works or how like how hard it is to make things happen and like to push forward so anyways that's that's one thing on the on that specific game if the roblox piece i don't know that people didn't really seem to care about the roblox piece they also didn't seem to be com complaining about the roblox piece and then there were these complaints about the tv show um i don't know i know that there were talks about trying to get a tv show i know there was a lot of conversations happening i don't know where that stands now um but I know that that was like a very genuine intention on the part of the team. And by the way, like I don't own any Momo gurus. I didn't even have the, the team was like maybe interested in coming on the podcast and I didn't have them on um, for a variety of reasons that we don't have to get into here. But like I, I do think this is not clearly a rug. I think they're still working on this, but I don't know for sure. What do you yeah. think of all that? I appreciate you playing more like the skeptical holder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, yeah. I, I think the Momogu holders, hopefully they, they don't um, take too much <laughs> offense to all of this. But I, I do think you're right in the sense that I think there's a lot of nuance here that um, sometimes it's a little bit harder to appreciate. And for me, like the standards I kind of like set for whether I call something a rug or not is, I think at the end of the day, it's probably going to be like what the intentions of the team are. Like if the team's intentions were malicious and they were just here, they, they already planned to just like take the money and just not do anything with it and, and do it, then yeah, I think to me, that's a rub. Um, but if the team like actually has something like genuine and they feel like, okay, this was actually an idea they had and they wanted to take it, but just so happened that either circumstances or maybe just a uh, poor execution on their, on their part because they are sort of like learning as well how the Web3 space works, then I think then I, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a rub. But it's just that, you know, as when we, in, when we sort of like um, get into all of these like early stage projects, which are basically most of these NFT teams, when you buy an NFT in this project, um, you have to exactly know like what you're getting into. And most of it is that um, it's mostly a faith and belief in the team that they're going to do something interesting um, yeah. with the project. And, you know, you take that risk as well. And if, if nothing happens, then it's very really hard to go back. You can't go back to, I like, say, customer support, customer service and say, hey, I want a refund for all of this because I think that's just not what they set out to do when they actually did the mint and the sale. Yeah. Now, I, you know, I... I, I'm with you and, and, and that's why I think this is not I, I I feel very confident this was like not this actually wasn't just like a cash grab I don't even think you know thinking about what they have probably spent wholesale on the one game on the Roblox piece like I don't get the sense they've made a, a ton of money out of this whole thing to be honest um, and I know a lot of the things that they were rep they were saying they were trying to do or they were saying they were doing they were trying to do now I don't think a lot of those have entirely worked out but again it's also a bear market this is the really hard thing about trying to marry a web 2 company with the web 3 space like if holders don't see activity and movement and hype trailers and they think nothing's happening but web 2 companies are not used to operating like that right like the baobao team is not is not used to having to like respond to 5,000 people in a Discord on a daily basis and give, like, throw them red meat to get pumped about. Like, stuff takes time. And again, like, I, I think the Baobab team has totally failed. I, I should get it right if it's Baobab or Baobab. Baobab. <laughs> I keep, I'm like saying both over the course of this interview, but, or over the course of this conversation, but like, I think they have totally messed up their comms. I think they absolutely overinflated expectations, allowed expectations to be overinflated. I think they don't know how to handle the criticism now. Um, but I really, I don't know how you look at this and and think it's like a rug. Like the, I, and I know this team did not come into this intending 
to like screw a bunch of holders over. And again, I don't think they've stopped working. Like I think they actually still are trying to push this IP forward and, and make a show happen. There's also a dynamic here where, you know, they're getting, there's so much hate then once the FUD starts. And it becomes like a very toxic environment to even want to keep building in, right? It's like, why would I want to keep building when I just feel like everybody like hates me all the time and nothing we do is ever like considered enough or good enough or, you know, they were going to, they went to various conferences with this IP that they were trying to, they were showing off the game and, and the conferences at, at various conferences. Like this is just not a, they didn't like, you know, try and try and totally bounce on this. Now, you know, one of the complaints has also been that they bragged a lot about the Baobab studio team who won these awards. But then the Baobab studio team brought in this woman, Alex, who goes by Axel Little on, on Discord, who has like a, more of a Web3 background. And she appeared, she was like the front facing person. So like she was communicating a lot with holders. Like she was sort of like spearheading a lot of this project. So there was also sort of this talk that like, oh see, like the Baobab team isn't even really that involved in this. It's really more just like this woman, Alex, that they've brought in. But I think that's tricky too, because again, the Baobab team are not Web3 people. Like they did not as a studio necessarily, like they're not necessarily wired to be in Discord all day long. So you want that Web3 person who can be a part of the team interfacing on Discord. Like I just think there's multiple sides to every story. I really did not anticipate coming on this podcast and just like being such a full-throated defender of Momo Guru, but it, it, it's more this like broader issue I have with with the way projects just get so attacked by people who I feel like aren't really trying to understand the perspective of the team. They're only looking out for their own bags and they're only mad because their token hasn't gone up. It is what it starts to feel like at a certain point. Yeah, exactly right. I, I think it the bear market always brings these these kind of vibes out. Like when you're when whatever yeah. you buy, like prices go down, then I think like it's just natural that people get angry, people trying to find ways to to sort of like um <clears throat> I guess like take the blame away from what they're doing and try to put it on something else so that you don't feel so bad about it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a very human nature um thing to kind of do. But I think it does speak to one of the biggest issues is that I think like any web tool like brand or team that actually really wants to get into Web3 space, they really do need to um, <clears throat> understand the space better um, before sort of like coming in. Because like, you know, once you once you launch an NFT project, you have like thousands of holders. It's almost like taking your, um, your company to the stock market, right? And suddenly you need to manage all these different stakeholders like within this. And if you don't do it correctly, then it, it can actually lead to a lot of these like consequences. People start funding your project and they don't like what you're doing. And basically that leads to sort of like a bit of a death spiral of what you're doing uh, around that. So I, I feel like there's a lot, there are a lot of learnings I think from this whole experience that um, I think like many other like Web2 founders who are looking to launch NFTs can sort of like take away from this as well. So I, hopefully that yeah. is some positivity that comes out of all of this. I also just worry that it's going to put off other teams or like what anybody like from launching an NFT project because who would want to deal with this? Like I just I've been in real companies or real like startups before and you have ideas that you're super excited about that you start to try and go you go down that path and then you realize oh shit you know what that's actually not working we're going to hit xyz obstacles we have to pivot now we have to go over here oh we were going to engage with this team to do this kind of social media content but oh you know what we've realized like given the resources we have left that's not a good use of resources right now while we're in a bear market let's pivot over here and the problem is if you are trying to communicate with holders and you're talking about the things you're excited about as they're popping up in meetings but then as happens with stuff like a month later, oh, that's actually not the direction we're going. It looks like you didn't follow through on this promise, but it, it, it feels to me like there's machinations that happen when you're in startups, when you're in business, when you're trying to do anything that are just completely non-conducive to a community facing like a, a publicly building project. Every NFT project has dealt with this and experienced this. And in some ways that makes me a broken record. I will say... There is a point during building, and I don't know if this should apply to Baobab or not. If they're not building anymore, then it should. If they are still building, then it doesn't. But like where if you think it's really not going to work, something you're doing, like if the TV show isn't going to be able to come to fruition or, you know, whatever, look at how much money you have left and decide if you can like partially refund holders. Because, you know, these NFTs sold for 0.22 ETH. Like that's, that's a lot of money in some ways. And... 
if you're not going to be able to keep pushing on the project or you don't have enough resources left to really do what you want to do with it, the best use is just you sold a product, you didn't deliver on what you said the product was going to do, give the money back. Um, mm. And I think that's the most honorable way to handle it. But but yeah. I do think this team has delivered two out of the three things they said they were going to do. And, um, and they weren't like tiny things. I, you know, again, a game that people maybe didn't love, but like I know time and energy went into to making it a, a lot of time and energy and money went into making it and then you know a uh this this roblox thing yeah i mean i guess like if you look at it like um i mean they raised like maybe about 2000 ETH or so that so that's maybe about like four three to four million so at the grand scheme of things is also i not think they huge. raised more i think it was like probably oh, ETH okay. was higher i think it was like five and i don't know what their okay. like treasury management want i think it was like somewhere between like five and eight million they made but Okay, got it. Yeah, I mean, it's not. Yeah, yeah it's it's difficult to like build all these different things as well, and you probably spend quite a bit um, on that as well. Um, yeah, I I just wish that maybe they could have communicated things a little bit better. Like I feel like that was the only yep. missed opportunity. If you've done it, I think people would understand. Yep. Like, if you come out there and say like, "Hey, we tried our best, we mm -hmm. did this, but unfortunately, the game isn't doing well and stuff," I think people will kind of get it. But it's just that I think because they left a lot of things that were untied, all these loose Unsaid. ends, people just come. Yeah, they just try and speculate. People just speculate and figure out what's going on and. Yeah, it is what it yeah, is. Yeah, they totally fucked that up. And that's the key to being a good NFT project founder is like, like look at somebody like a Frank, right? Where mm -hmm. people have been disappointed with their output time and time again, but Frank comes out and owns it and says we're going to fix it and we're still working. And um, totally, they completely have just like, they've been terrible on the comms front. And um, and yeah. they should be dinged for that. Like that's, that, that's not nothing. Like that's important. I totally agree. So again, I, I'm like... I was like, oh, I want to have just like a nuanced conversation about Momoguru. And somehow when I started talking, I was like, I do want to defend this because I do feel strongly about some of the specific accusations that were made in this Loki threat. And again, I have like literally nothing to do with this team at all remotely. Yeah. Like I have, but I just, I've seen this, I see this kind of behavior and it just like, I'm like, God, people are so, to call this a rug just feels really <laughs> like they've delivered two fucking games in some ways. I, again, I know people didn't think they were fun, but um all right, Tang, thank you so much for joining me for this. This is so fun. I love your insights. I love your work. People should follow you on Twitter. You're, are you, uh, you're OX Prismatic? What's, you, what's your Twitter handle? Yeah, that's right. So OX, uh, I think zero X, sorry, zero X Prismatic. Zero X. Um, yeah. So you can just follow me. I'm always there. I try to tweet NFT stuff every now and then. Um, but yeah, no, this has been super fun. Like, I feel like the, you know, it's been an hour or so. It just sort of like flew by. Um, and we had so much interesting things to stuff I like talk about, even in such dark days, I guess. like Even the in the NFT doldrums. Guys. Exactly. Awesome. Well, we'll have you back on for sure. And we'll put your, your Twitter handle in the show notes. And uh, until next time. And also, credit, thank you, Tang. It is like 1 a.m. where you are. So <laughs> I'm very grateful for you uh, pulling a little late night shift here for Overwise JPEGs. Yeah, no worries. Like, uh, always fun. I'm always happy to be here and, and, and chat. NFTs like, is just such a big part of my life. And yeah, it just energizes me just talking about all these things, whether it's good or bad or so. So yeah, enjoyed this so much. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out, it helps the show out, and it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.